I feel like I should have helped you. Oh, no, 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 it would have embarrassed me even more. Uh, so Messenger is at this pivotal point in its history. It's, it's nearing a billion users. You guys are starting to monetize. There's huge opportunities on the horizon with working with businesses. But it's also a risky time because there's a lot of change going on on the platform. So Messenger is run independently from Facebook technically, but you guys are in the same office. So how do you work with Mark Zuckerberg? And has he vetoed any products that you and uh, David Marcus have put out there? We work very uh, collaboratively on everything. And so he is ultimately involved in all the decisions that we are making. And uh, Facebook generally has a very unique culture and we learned as a company a lot over the years. So the way it goes, we constantly sort of agree on the goals and we are trying to arrive to those goals as quickly as possible with the means the team is putting together. And uh, uh, we are in 100% agreement on where we want to go. And when you agree where you want to go, it's all about figuring out a way to get there. And uh, we are doing general reviews and we are generally staying on the same page. So from that standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Is there any piece of the product that he's really pushed forward and said, that, I, I want this to happen, make it happen for me? Interesting question. The, uh, uh, everything what you see is pretty much uh, kind of fits into uh, his view of the world and it fits into ours. And uh, from that standpoint, uh, we are pushing each other to build more and build faster and build better. And another thing is that we are a very data-driven company and wouldn't be surprised to you that we have a lot of data. And generally, data trumps any argument, right? So as long as we have data that backs up what we want to do and uh, as long as we give him all the data that he wants to see in order to uh, support where we are going, everything just goes smoothly. It, do you guys, is there one of you that's more data-driven and one that's more you know, gut and hunch-driven? Uh, one of... Like is, is, does Mark really like to rely on the data for where to go, or do you, does he have hunches that he says, like, we're going to do this? Well, we all always have hunches, but we also have a discipline on uh, backing up those hunches with data. And uh, uh, that's how we are looking at stuff. So we, uh, we all have different hunches all the time, uh, but we are generally all agree that data is first, and whenever you have hunch, you'd better have data to support that hunch. So Facebook owns WhatsApp as well. It's sort of interesting that it's running uh, Messenger and WhatsApp in parallel. Could you describe what you see as the differences in purpose and intent between Messenger and WhatsApp? Yeah, that's an uh, awesome question. So um, again, Facebook is a very different company in the sense that uh, uh, we don't look for trouble where there isn't any. And uh, in most companies, and big companies, whenever something like that happens, like what, what, there are two divisions of the companies that are working on similar things, then it would be like a bunch of consultants running, telling everybody that uh, we need to find synergies and we need to put it together and we need to somehow rationalize and other stuff. And uh, we don't have that culture at Facebook whatsoever. So what happens is that WhatsApp is having incredible penetration in a uh, developing world and uh, it's growing really, really, really fast there. And Messenger is growing really, really fast in a developed world. And from that standpoint, it's very complementary one to another. And uh, there are certain countries where we both are growing, but we are just learning from each other and we are trying to make each other better. But no one is trying to figure out some synergies or anything like that because clearly WhatsApp is doing excellent on their own and Messenger is doing pretty well on its own as well. Does that mean that Messenger kind of holds back from pushing growth in the developing world saying we don't want to cannibalize WhatsApp? We think the world is bigger than that and uh, we're not pushing back on growth anywhere and so neither is WhatsApp, it's just happening the way it's happening. The way it's happening, they have very clear value proposition, very strong value proposition in the countries where the SMS is free and they're growing really fast there and uh, we have strong value proposition uh, in places where SMS is not free and we are growing fast there, so it's just organic. 
Yeah, it seems like you guys are kind of running an A-B test with Messenger really rich media focused and trying to work very closely with businesses, whereas WhatsApp is more of a clean, uh, simple messaging experience. Uh, what have you guys learned from that A-B test? Like, have you pulled anything from, oh, mess or, you know, WhatsApp does this really well, or uh, WhatsApp's been, oh, we should do something similar to what, what uh, Messenger is doing right now? What we learned is just what I said, basically, is that, uh, one thing works extremely well in a developing world and another one works very well in developed world. And so we continue, we're gonna to continue to do that. Does Messenger itself work differently in those different markets? Do you have products or features that are only in certain No, we're the same way everywhere. We're uh, running a bunch of tests, obviously, and some of those tests are country-based tests, uh, but rather than that, we are trying to keep the experience pretty much unified across the world. So. Facebook famously split Messenger off of uh, the original Facebook app. Right. And at the beginning, there was a big backlash about it. Uh, how has that backlash changed over time? Uh, well, again, uh, it all comes to data, and we measure how people feel about certain things. And uh, at this point, it's pretty clear that people are happy with us making that decision because Everything what we thought is going to happen is happening. People are getting responses to their messages way faster now because it's a separate app, it's a separate push notification. Uh, the structure is different and they're thinking about it in a different way. It became from sort of, I can respond to that later type of a thing, how people treated Facebook messengers, to I need to respond to that right now. It's all sort, it's sort of like the same as SMS and the sense of urgency went up. And as a result, people are getting responses better, people are having more conversations on Messenger, and they're genuinely happy because it gives them a way to stay connected with people they care about, uh, much more connected than it used to be. So all the data we are looking at that point uh, suggests one simple thing, that it was a good decision that we made back then. That's fascinating to hear that it moved uh, Facebook chat from being more like email where people respond asynchronously to more like SMS when they respond right away. That's, but, you, but, that's been your experience as well. Yeah, definitely. But you, know, you, you cited a lot of quantitative data. Is there qualitative data that says people actually like this experience or are they just being forced to use it? Because I know a lot of people, they feel like, yeah, they're forced to, so yeah, they're using it more, they're opening their messages faster, but they didn't really have a choice in the matter. So do you guys have qualitative research showing yes, that people- Yes, we have a like bunch of qualitative research. We constantly measure sentiment as well, and sentiment way went, sentiment about messaging went up uh, compared to what it used to be. Cool. So let's talk about the chatbot platform a little bit. You know, Facebook launched its chatbot platform with these opportunities to absorb customer service and commerce and content distribution. But a lot of the critics felt that the early bots were kind of useless and they, they were built by techies in, in California who didn't understand what the average user really wanted. Right. What, what's your response to that criticism? Uh, general response is sort of, uh Let's take a look at all the platforms that they launched and let's look at the early days of any platform. Let's look at uh, iOS platform when it launched, months after it launched. All the apps people were talking about, it was like uh, beer burping type of stuff and lightsaber lightning and uh, there was nothing serious going on versus what we have today. And uh, it's just months old, that kind of sums it up. And of course, people who jump on first, trying to learn how it all works, and they're building very light-headed experiences, and they're playing with it, and they're trying to figure out what platform allows and what platform doesn't allow. And frankly, we are trying to figure out what to allow and not to allow, because we are learning like everybody else. The good news is that we have tens of thousands of developers who are already jumping on to be on the platform. We have already over 2,500 merchants that are on uh, through Shopify and selling their products today. We have a bunch of early signs that the platform is starting to work, but it's way too early to point out to anything. Uh, and the sheer nature of that is just, it's just how many developers are there, uh, how fast they're pushing forward, and uh, how quickly we react to what we learn. The way we look at that is pretty simple, right? So uh, that platform needed to exist. We know where the future is. Uh, we don't know exactly the path to that future, 
just like any other company or any other startup, what we do know is that we have 900 million people behind us, and we're gonna do everything what we can to protect them, and we're gonna figure out our path forward that will protect our users and will allow developers to build the amazing experiences. So those are some new stats that tens of thousands of developers are now on the bot platform, 2,500 merchants from Shopify are on the platform. Is this our new? But the ones that you guys picked for the launch, I mean, I gotta say, Poncho the Weather Cat, that thing is so dumb. It's just heartbreakingly annoying to, to see that you guys put that up as the thing that you said, this is what bots should be like. I, you know, there has to be something that you learned from the bot launch that you would have done differently. Like, maybe well, I that. just learned that you don't like Poncho. <laughs> <laughs> Poncho needs to take a, a trip to the vet, at, at the very least. Uh, no, but, but what do you think that you guys, what would you have done differently if you could do the, pl uh, the platform launch over again? Uh, we would have uh, had more time, uh, and uh, we would uh, spend more time on uh, perfecting certain things on a platform, but nothing in general, like you have to get out there in order to start learning. Again, uh, my analogy with startup wasn't uh, just a random analogy. Again, we just know where to go. Uh, we know that it needs to exist, but exact path there, we need to figure it out. In order to figure out, you have to be out there. So we got out there and we are learning. Our number one goal is to protect our 900 million people. Our number two goal is to support developers. And if these two things will come together, then we're gonna arrive to a bright and shiny future. Uh, when you, when the when the launch happened, though, there, a lot, there felt like there was still a lot of spam going on. Like the, the the bots have the opportunity to message you on a regular basis, and that that feels a little bit dehumanizing. You know, in my experience, Messenger was always this thing that when it buzzed, I immediately opened it because I knew it was one of my friends. I knew it was something that I cared about. But now with with the bots, suddenly I get messages from things that I might really not care about or don't feel timely or urgent, and it makes me less likely to answer any of the messages. So what are you guys doing specifically to prevent spam from spiraling out of control on the bot platform? Uh, so you're referring to that piece that you wrote on us a few days ago. Yes, the dehumanization yeah. of Facebook Messenger is a piece I wrote this week, and right. I, I hope that hit hard because I, I really don't want to see the platform end up a, a, a spammy like the Facebook news feed did when the game platform launched and Zynga destroyed it. Uh, again, uh, what we do care about is uh, how our people feel about that. So even a uh, signal like your own is important to us. The, uh, the way uh, we are thinking about it is actually pretty simple. Uh, the, we need to give users ability to manage all of that stuff. And really, what you're saying is that um, you're sitting there, you are not sure what's arriving right now, whether it's from a friend or whether it's arriving from some sort of a bot. Though this bot is something that you subscribe. So what we need to figure out is that right set of controls and right set of experiences that would separate the two. And uh, we are on it. One thing that we are doing right now is that we had that block button uh, that would allow people to block. Now we are sort of going to be expanding it and ch change it to ma manage. And so you will be able to figure out the right frequency with which you want to get certain notifications from certain bots and not to do that and other stuff. At the end of the day, what we have to make sure is that the push notifications that are very relevant to you, Josh, actually arriving on time, and the ones that are not relevant or not as urgent, they can be sort of like blocked together or they can arrive later and other stuff. I think we have enough data, enough capabilities, enough learning, enough much, uh, enough uh, uh, computer power to figure it out. That's really fascinating. So you're talking about maybe having messages from bots be delayed or not cause the same notifications. You know, I would love to see them have a different ring or like a different noise that they make or have a different vibration pattern so I can know, oh, that's something I need to look at right away. Like, all of those are possibilities and uh, all of those are things that we can do. We just need to learn, you know, to know. That's why we launched, right? So to predict how everything gonna work out is very hard, but what's even harder is to make all of those adjustments with no data. Because I can bet you that your pattern of uh, consuming those will be very different from the pattern of many other people, and it's all on an individual basis. So we'll have to learn what it is, and we'll have to deliver you exactly what you want. But that's number one priority for us. Facebook famously 
uh, tests its products in the wild. You know, oftentimes it'll test them in New Zealand so that they're you know in, in English-speaking country, but that reporters like me don't find out about these tests. You know, but it can be tougher when you're doing a, uh, a big platform launch and you really want to keep it secret to some degree. And, and I know you guys do a lot of testing internally with Facebook employees, but, but Facebook employees are not like the normal people. They're, they're more tech-centric. They probably have a lot more friends on the platform. There are so, differences. Yeah, so did you guys do any external user testing of the bot platform and these bots before they launched? But as you said, it's very hard to do. So no, we haven't. So. Uh, uh, we haven't done external testing, so we went the way we went because we needed to get out there. And uh, you might be right, certain uh, imperfections might be explained by the fact that we were not allowed to be as precise in our testing as we generally trying to be. Is there anything specific, like any specific learnings that you have you've received from the general out external user base now that it's out there? Yeah, like having like block action uh, right in the front, in the center, in the right corner wasn't the best. And so we are changing it to manage because uh, so people can actually have variety of options there and they can mute certain things and things like that. So again, giving people more control seems to be what people want to have. And uh, that's one of the learnings that we had. I know the developers, they want uh, more control too. Are you guys planning anything like around a, a chatbot analytics platform or program so the developers can self-police themselves and make sure they aren't turning their own customers or fans off with too much spam? Yes, we are very actively working on a bunch of tools that we need to give to our developers to build better bots. That's cool, so chatbot analytics are coming. Yes. Okay, great. So. What do you think is the next big priority for Messenger looking towards 17 outside of bots and businesses? Well, we need to uh, nail that, right? So, because uh, our num number one priority always going to be people to people communication. That's what we want, that's what we like, that's why people like us, that's why people use us, and that's what's going on. But uh, if we can make it easier for people to actually communicate with businesses, that seems like a massive opportunity. Uh, because the way it's done right now on mobile, as you know, it doesn't work. And uh, the whole thing is just not there. It's very hard to do on mobile. All you can do is call. And people don't want to call, especially young people want to call less and less. Do you so think it's kind of robotic the way that we normally use our phones and, and deal with like touch tone phone trees and stuff, right? That's, that's pretty much where you end up being, right? So you, like the best experience that you have today on your phone is you call the business and then you are in a phone tree. And it's, to your point, you were talking about dehumanization. That is very dehumanizing, right? And we are actually trying to make it more human uh, because uh, eventually it's easier to talk than it is to sit on that tree. And it's easier to actually chat and text than it is to sit on the phone tree. And so we're going to continue to focus on that and try to do these two pillars of our success very successful again. One is people-to-people -people communication and another people-to-business -people communication. See, I'm really interested in people-to-people-to-people -to -people -to -people communication. You guys just launched group calling and, and that went pretty well, right? Yes, so group calling. Yes, we, we just released it. We haven't really uh, promoted, we haven't told anybody about that, but yes, uh, like a week ago we launched group calling worldwide and on the first day we had 11 million minutes uh, in groups. And generally, everything that has to do with VoIP on our platform has been growing really, really fast. You remember, I think it was last F8, not that one, but the one the year before when Mark said that we had 10% of the market there, and that was shortly after we launched. And since then, we've been growing very, very quickly as well. So any startup would be happy with the growth rate we had uh, since then till now. And group calling 11 minutes on the first 24 hours without telling anybody, that's pretty good. It's pretty smart that considering that you know, Facebook bought WhatsApp and really the worry was that Google might have bought it and turned messaging into this big two horse race. And I feel like you guys have had a lot more time and sort of freedom to, to test new things and work on stuff. You know, Google has Hangouts, but it doesn't have users on any of its messaging platforms. And so you guys have really been able to spring ahead with things like group chat. Is, uh, is group video calling on the way? Are we gonna get that next? No comment on that right now. No comment, come on, you know it'll be so much fun. We agree, that would be an excellent experience. <laughs> okay, so, so just finally, what was it, what's a growing focus for you that maybe two years ago you didn't foresee as being a big part of messaging? The, uh, how much messaging starts to 
own, uh, like I, I had high expectations obviously coming in, but at this point it's uh, surpassing my wildest dreams from the standpoint like how much we can actually end up owning. Uh, because you just look how the ecosystem is developing and uh, more things that are bro more things are broken than they are not on mobile when it comes to commerce, when it comes to communication with businesses, even when it comes to communications with people and the richness of the communications that existing platforms can't provide, but they just don't because it's not there. And it's hard to build platform uh, from scratch and there are a lot of attempts there. Uh, when people are trying to build a platform that deliver all those experience, but then they don't have any users. So uh, when you can actually combine something that has 900 million people and it's growing really, really fast, and you actually understand where the world is going and you're trying to introduce all of those experiences into that platform uh, really quickly and experiment with that, it's just the power that that gives and given that we are trying to sort of do it based on uh, engineering organization that is one of the best in the world is uh, really allows us to do incredible things. So there is a lot more to come. Yeah, I mean, with, with businesses, developers, and users all looking forward to that big one billion number, that ubiquity is going to afford you some really big new opportunities. So thank you so much That's for coming and talking with us. Thank today. you. Thank you.